Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's virtual presentation as a part of our 2021 Global Health Leaders Conference at Johns Hopkins University. Today we are incredibly honored to have Dr. Peter Agri at our conference. Uh, to introduce Dr. Agri, he is overall an incredible leader in global health and medicine. He is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, and recipient of the 2003 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of aquaporins. He has had an amazing career in global health and medicine that we are so excited to learn from today. Dr. Agri, we're again very grateful to have you at our conference this year. Thanks, Sam. Welcome to the, all the young people. I realize Zoom lecture is not the same as being in the lecture hall, but I'll, I'll do my best. And what I have planned is to talk about global health, but not from the viewpoint of molecular structures or pathogens, but to talk about the people affected because the program here at Johns Hopkins is worldwide. And as young people interested in global health, let me assure you there are gonna be great opportunities for you to invest your talents, make the world a better place and have a fascinating career. So I know I speak for Johns Hopkins faculty that we look to the future and we're looking for at least some of you to join us here at Hopkins. So opening doors worldwide through science sounds a little bit simplistic, but in fact, as a medical scientist, I found myself and my colleagues welcome to places where our, our government is detested. So th there's a reason that we should be performing our career work in terms of global health, but also, also there's a side benefit in terms of friendships amongst nations. And I think the medical scientists amongst nations are friends worldwide. And let's hope we can reduce some of the other barriers. So this is gonna be my Facebook of science, not literally, but it, figuratively, you're gonna see the pictures of a lot of people and I'll tell you some interesting facts about them. So science is done by young people. Young people have always done science. And this guy in the center was a young fellow from Minnesota who 50 years ago, made his way to Johns Hopkins to study global health, heading west to get east. I, that was me. I had a full head of hair, my knees were full cartilage. And uh, I was frisky and eager to see the world and put my efforts into making the world a better place. So fast forward 30, 30 years later, here I am with my family at the Nobel Awards. And if you look in the little corner picture, that's me 50 years later. So we all get older. And with that, we hope we gain wisdom and opportunities, but it's, it's a transition. And the interest starts very young. So this is 2003, my wife, my children in Stockholm for the discovery of water channels. But I felt a little unfulfilled because I'd always been interested in global health and took a different tack Prior to the Nobel, our laboratory was studying the water channel proteins, the aquaporins. We started looking at parasites, including malaria. Of course, malaria is well known to be a scourge that causes the deaths of hundreds of thousands of children. And even though it's a 19th century disease in terms of its mechanism of infection, we understand it, we still haven't eradicated it. And the culprit vector for spreading this is the Anopheles mosquito. Hard to believe a mosquito is the deadliest animal in the world. But the Anopheles mosquitoes, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of children. In Southeast Asia and in the Amazon, there's also malaria, but Sub-Saharan Africa is the major site of malaria. So this is also, you can superimpose with this map, a map describing the economic opportunities. Malaria exists where poverty exists, but it can be addressed. And I think you'll I hope you'll get a sense of that during, during the slideshow. So I'm gonna talk about our work in several different countries. First, Zambia. Now, when I was your age, Africa had just gone through the liberation in the 1960s, most, most of the, Sub-Saharan African countries were colonial and they threw off their colonial yokes and became independent. 
And the nation that we, it was called Rhodesia, was formed from two states, Northern Rhodesia, which became independent and now known as Zambia, and Southern Rhodesia, which is now known as Zimbabwe. And Zambia and Zimbabwe are culturally, ethnically, and economically close, but the governments are quite different. Zambia became a liberal democracy. Kenneth Kaunda was the president, and they did a pretty good job in terms of using global health initiatives to improve the well being of the people. But there still is a lot of problems. So malaria seems very unfair. It's not a, as much a problem in older people. The opposite of COVID, which takes its greatest toll on the older people, malaria affects the youngsters. And these little fellows are playing in a village outside of our field station in southern Zambia, would be considered pretty much middle class by African standards. The kids, at least three of them have sandals and they, they look well fed and protected against disease such as malaria, but others are not so fortunate. Here's my hero, Philip Tuma, um, Johns Hopkins trained pediatrician who has worked in Zambia and Zimbabwe his whole career. And with him is one of his patients who was brought in with severe malaria but has recovered. So it's a terrible illness but can, can be treated if treated early. But other instances, the child was not treated in time. This little boy was brought in with what was called cerebral malaria, comatose, and Phil saved his life. The boy survived, but you notice this disconjugate gaze it's because he's had permanent damage to the visual cortex in his brain. So he's sightless. And you can imagine what kind of disability that would be in the United States. Imagine how much more difficult it would be in Sub-Saharan Africa with so few resources. I'm a little bit in trouble here. I have Parkinson's disease, and so I have a problems with my voice and my motor control. So if I flip the slides in, there, in error, then I'll try to repair it. So how do you do research in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa? You have government approvals to get, you have university approvals to get, but you have to have the approval of the people and, and their government structure and the local level is still tribal. This is Chief Macha. He is a university graduate, he's a farmer in insurance business. And he looks out for the well being of his people in the Macha district where we're working with Dr. Tuma. And after working with him for quite a few years, Dr. Tuma convinced him to allow us to establish a malaria research institute to see if we could reduce the terrible burden of malaria in that part of Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm seeing all kinds of icons appearing on my laptop. There we go. And here's the, here's the lab team. This was probably about 10 years back. So Phil and I are working with these young scientists from Zambia and Zimbabwe, who all are university graduates. We're tracking the epidemic, the, the mosquitoes, the parasites, trying to get a grip on the spread of malaria in Africa. And here's the logo for our institute. The uh, institute was launched in the year 2000 because of a magnificent gift from a donor, initially anonymous. I can tell you his name now. His name is Michael Bloomberg. He was the mayor of New York, a Johns Hopkins alumnus, who was enormously generous and allowed us to form this institute that I'll tell you about. So we think in terms of Africa and the cities and the problems they have, that the countryside people lead quiet lives, very simple lives. The children do not have electronic toys. In fact, the, most places are not electrified. Ox cart is a major way of transporting goods. And these are the subsistence farmers who work their hearts out to feed their family, raising corn and peanuts and a few crops. They're amongst the poorest of the poor, not the very poorest of the poor, but amongst them, they probably have a income equivalent of maybe four or $5 a day. The poorest of the poor have an income of less than $2 a day. But when these farmers, the families are struck with malaria, things come to a halt because it's such a severe problem. And shown here, you can't see his face, that's Harry Hamakumbu, one of our field team leaders, screening the families 
of a village where a child has been diagnosed with malaria to see if they are carriers of the malaria parasite. And by treating everybody who's infected, we were able to bring it under control. So here's one of the local families. They're a little shy about having the picture taken, but I can assure you they're exceedingly grateful for what, what's provided. Now, this is the one data slide I'll show you. If, uh, if you're like me, when, when I was a student, if people show these data slides, somehow it would induce sleep. So I'm gonna show, show you one, but you don't need to look too closely to see that in the 20 years that we've been at work there, the burden of malaria has declined. And it's not some subtle reason. In 2003, the miracle drug artemisinin for which two you won the Nobel Prize. In 2015, artemisinin is in combination were introduced and look at the drop in 2004, 2005. And due to a stock outage, we couldn't treat in 2006. And of course the parasites came right back. 2007 was reinitiated and insecticide treated bed nets. It's caused a reduction of 95% of the malaria burden. 95% is outstanding, but it's not 100%. We know what'll happen if we cease our activities. Malaria will come right back. So what is the most precious commodity in Africa? We hear all about the gems, gemstones and the precious minerals. But if you ask the Africans that is their most precious commodity, they'll tell you it's their children. As impoverished as these people may be by American standards, they have a rich cultural and family life. And the children, of course, are very prized possession. And the children, of course, are becoming educated and Africa is emerging. And of course, these are adorable kids. When a poor family has a child, the planning and the resources are all reserved for the well-being of the next generation. I love this photo. These two little kids live outside of our field station in Macha in Southern Zambia. If you look closely, the little girl's notebook upside down says, school is cool. Maybe she's a future Johns Hopkins student. So I mentioned Zimbabwe. This was the former Southern Rhodesia. With independence, a different scene emerged. North, Northern Rhodesia became Zambia. Southern Rhodesia became Rhodesia, which was a white supremacist apartheid society, which underwent a civil war for 15 years. Horrific civil war, civil war finally ended and the nation of Zimbabwe emerged. Beautiful Zambezi River separates Zimbabwe from Zambia. Lovely part of the world. And here is the liberator of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, a Jesuit trained school teacher who became a civil freedom fighter, became president of the nation of Zimbabwe, but he stayed president for 37 years. And as I think we commonly accept in the United States, tenure in office is important, but you need to relinquish controls. And Mugabe's regime held on and drove the country into bankruptcy. It was previously the richest country in Sub-Saharan Africa and went into bankruptcy. Mugabe finally was deposed by a military coup and this was just four years ago. So how do you do work in a place like Zimbabwe, which is largely a police state? And the answer is you have, to, you have to be willing to make some compromises. Some of you have probably read Il Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, the idea of the end justifies the mean. And our partner institution in Zimbabwe, the Biomedical Research Training Institute is led by this lady, Shungu Minyati, who happens to be Robert Mugabe's niece. She's a wonderful scientist. She does not approve of the government policies, but she keeps it quiet because her mission is to knock out malaria. So working together, I think we can accomplish some, some good things. As I mentioned, Zimbabwe was once the richest country in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here's a tea estate in the Eastern Highlands, beautiful countryside, with tea farming. And here's some of the local workers, they have a job. This little boy is having the time of his life driving that tractor. But they lead very simple lives. If you can imagine summer camp, and then summer camp where you have to raise your own food, that's often the life of the, the people. It's arduous, 
they, they make their way as well as they can, drawing water for cooking, for washing, for religious purposes. So they're really leading outdoor lives. But the resources in Zim, like in Zam, that's our shorthand for Zimbabwe and Zambia, is the investment in the future, the children of Zimbabwe. This photograph I like, it's probably a man about my age. The names in Zimbabwe are often very religious, names from the Old Testament prophets. And then they have other names. Lovemore is a name. We have a friend, Lovemore, who runs Ura. Help more, pray more. And I met this gentleman, he's in a Sunday finest. He said his dream is to have malaria eradicated from Zimbabwe. And I asked him his name. He said his name is Never. But Never, that's a very odd name. And he smiled, he said, well, it's short. He was the youngest of nine children. When he was born, his, his mother named him Nevermore. Nevermore and I share a lot of things. And here's one of the health stations in rural, rural Zim. And these nurses, the three ladies in the front and the gentleman in the white shirt in the upper left, are at the St. Peter's Clinic. Very modest health clinic in rural Zim, a beautiful valley, but they're working 24 seven, 365. The problem is the resources, getting the medicines as they need them. But the staff is really diligent. But during the rainy season, every day, mothers bring their children in with malarial fevers. Malaria has returned to Zimbabwe and it's because of the lack of global health, good organization, the provision of medicines. And shown here is my friend, Sungano Marakura in the dark shirt, big smile. Sungano was a child who grew up in a village in Zimbabwe, a good student who was given a scholarship to the University of Zimbabwe, where he was a strong student and got a scholarship to Oxford University, where he did his PhD. And rather than looking for a lucrative job at a European pharmaceutical company, he followed his dream, his dream is to return to Zimbabwe to knock out malaria. He's now the Dean at Africa University in Mutare, leading the fight against malaria. So Zim has been a bigger challenge than we initially thought. Congo was even more difficult. The Democratic Republic of Congo. One of the things I've noticed that any country that calls itself the Democratic Republic or the People's Democratic Republic is probably not a democracy. And Congo has been a very difficult situation now for more than 50 years. Katanga province, the southeast, is adjacent to northern Zambia. And we, we've been working in, in Congo for the last five years. This is a part of the world with a lot of instability. Your parents will know of Doug Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the United Nations who was working here, he was killed in a plane crash, trying to make peace because the warring factions were ruining life for everybody. But here we have my colleague, Bill Moss. Dr. Moss is a professor of epidemiology at Johns Hopkins, lecturing in Kinshasa to the Congolese medical students. And the field work is to assess the distribution of medicines provided by donor nations, including ours. President's Malaria Initiative, launched by President George Walker Bush, 15 years ago has been a developmental game changer, but the challenge is oftentimes getting the medicines from the warehouses in the capital cities to the people. And therein people like Dan Carlson, a Swedish American pilot play the role because Congo is as large, actually it's, it's almost twice as large as Alaska, but with very few roads, and no paved roads. So air, air travel in these small planes is the only way we can get around. Eastern Congo, very marshy, no paved roads. But down on the ground, the village elders, like Chief Macha, these are now in a different part of Africa, but the same social structure, are directing their efforts to provide education and health for the children. And these Congolese children, impoverished as they are, lead happy lives, but we have to be on guard because most years 
these children, most of them will get developed malaria. So we've been to Africa and I'd like to tell you about some of our work in Cuba. So in 1960, a revolution occurred in Cuba. Cuba had long been viewed by the United States as a potential territory, or at least a, a sovereign nation close to us. But after the turn of the 20th century, the 19th, 20th century, Cuba became the purview of gambling casinos and things descended. But way back in 1900, a wonderful scientific collaboration occurred. The Spanish-American War, which led to the liberation of Cuba from Spain, coincided with an exacerbation of the endemic yellow fever. Yellow fever was a disease of unknown origin, which affected thousands of people, including many US troops who with Theodore Roosevelt decisively defeated the Spanish in Cuba. But it was a Cuban born physician, Carlos Finley, who in his addition to his clinical work, recognized that yellow fever was not likely spread by swamp gas or dirty laundry. He, he reasoned it must be passed by the mosquitoes, the Aedes mosquitoes. And on the right, Jesse Lazier, handsome young Johns Hopkins bacteriologist with Walter Reed led the Yellow Fever Commission and established that the mosquitoes carry the disease. So yellow fever is a bad problem like COVID, but it's not fatal for most people. And, and to prove that the transmission occurred by mosquitoes, Lazier allowed himself to be bitten by mosquitoes that had feasted on yellow fever patients. And he developed yellow fever, but unfortunately he got a severe form and died. So he was gone, but together they were credited with doing something immensely important, demonstrating for the first time that yellow fever and other diseases were probably caused by mosquitoes. So by caring for the mosquito population, yellow fever disappeared. Now the revolution in Cuba, I won't get into the politics, but there's still remnants reminding us because Cuba has has been overlooked by the United States for a long time. And the revolutionary spirit continues in these reminders of the great days of the revolution, but it's a long gone. This is 50 years, 60 years in the past. But because of the embargoes, and the embargoes were a political decision by the United States to drive Cuba economically to its knees, preventing, preventing the import of automobiles, even building materials and medicines. So you see some of the old cars preserved in Havana and places, and they're, they're a nostalgic reminder of pre-revolutionary days, but they're really kind of museum pieces because the cars you see on the street are really dilapidated and there are very few of them. But where there's been investment in Cuba, the architecture, the, particularly the colonial architecture is lovely, but where there's not been investment, it's crumbling. Cuba has suffered immensely from the embargo and the health of the people has been a primary goal of the regime. So this is a young revolutionary who led Cuba, Fidel Castro. And while Castro is regarded badly in the United States by many, there are some good things he did. I'll get into those. We don't have to, do, to agree politically with individuals to do good works. Castro himself, while he's trained as a lawyer, he was a champion athlete, he auditioned for the pitcher for American League and the Major League Baseball, an incredible individual, but he led the revolution. And one of the first things he did is to reinstore science, the Academy of Sciences in Cuba. And he also established Cuba as a source of medicines. Cuba previously, prior to the revolution, there was no provision of healthcare unless you had money to pay for it. Healthcare became free for all and medicines were available. He also started a medical school, the Latin American Medical School in Havana, which is one of the world's largest medical schools in providing medical doctors for indigenous countries, in the Amazon, Venezuela, and throughout Africa, there are many Cuban physicians. 
And here's some of the their students. Now here is the Cuban relief during the Ebola out, outbreak. It was five years ago when Ebola erupted in Western Africa, the United States and other nations stepped up, Cubans most of all, to provide aid and to limit the spread of the disease. And while there were thousands of people who died, they were able to stem the spread of the Ebola virus. So working in Cuba, I became friends with Fidel Castro's son, who is a physicist, he's now passed on. But he arranged one evening for, for my colleagues and me to meet with his father. So this was Fidel Castro towards the end of his life, still very stern. And I must say he was exceedingly intelligent, even though the conversation was in Spanish, he spoke perfect English. And there was a lot of rever revolutionary rhetoric which he still shared. But we agreed that universal health was something that all nations should agree on. Everyone should have access to these miracle drugs and healthcare. So even to these two aging people of myself and grandparent and Fidel Castro grandparent could agree on that very much. I was invited to lecture at the University of Havana, a wonderful university that has existed now for more than a hundred years. And the priority is to teach science to the young people. And after my lecture, I was swarmed by these young people. They wanted their picture taken with me. They want to have the opportunity to come to the United States to study science. It would be wonderful if we can have a relationship with Cuba where they could come and st study science and not have any political fears. And here I am speaking, this is just a couple of years ago. And to my left and your right is Fidel Castro's son, Fidelito. So there are friends in Cuba and they're doing some very good things, even though our governments can't agree on many things, they can't agree on some things that are very important. I'd like to tell you just briefly about some of our experiences in Iran. It's now more, more than 40 years in the past, the Islamic revolution occurred. Was, Iran was prior to then supported by a regime, the Shah being put in place when a CIA-led revolt crushed the government of Iran. And the Islamic revolution was a reaction to that. But while it has restored Islam as a state religion in Iran, it, it's led to a lot of hardship for people who fled Iran for their personal liberty. It's a theocracy. This is a supreme ayatollah, very hardcore, and that's really where the decisions for the country are made. They have an elected president. I, I've met this man, this was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who's the president seven years ago. Bit of a dogmatic individual, but in private, he understood the need for cooperation amongst countries. Even as he, he exuded very hostile rhetoric towards the United States in private, he was simply a politician trying to survive. So I was invited to give a series of lectures in Iran. I think it was seven years back. And I was a bit nervous about it. There had been assassinations of nuclear engineers on the streets of Tehran. But what I learned is that there were great individuals in Iran with scholarship being their major focus. These are students at the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran. They're outstanding students. Several of them have gone on to distinguish careers as engineers. I think a large fraction of the engineering graduate students at Stanford are from Sharif University. And I'm with my wife, Mary, and Norm Newrider for this lecture trip. Now, this is a man you probably don't recognize. His name is Ali Akbar Salehi. He was the former chancellor of the Sharif University of Technology foreign foreign minister of Iran, former director of the Iranian Atomic Energy Agency. And you might be interested that he is a graduate of MIT. He lived in the United States for several years. He is very balanced. He is not an adversary of the United States. In fact, his brother, one of his brothers is a neurosurgeon who lives in Chicago. 
Another is an engineer who lives in Washington and his niece is an eye doctor at Johns Hopkins. She's my eye doctor. These are wonderful people. And when the discussion of the enrichment of uranium was underway back during the Obama administration, a nuclear accord was signed. And Ali Akbar Alehi, Salehi on the right was the proponent, leading proponent within the Iranian contingent. And on the left is Ernest Moniz, his professor at MIT, who was the head of the American delegation. So here's a scientific friendship that led to an incredible opportunity for Iran to improve, enrich uranium to the level they could use it to generate electricity, but not to make any weapons. But this was, was overturned by the past administration, but we're hoping it can be restored. There's every reason to be optimistic. There are people like Ali Akbar Salehi in Iran who want the best for everyone. So I'll, I'll close by showing like, photographs of North Korea. Oftentimes when I give a lecture like this and, and before the COVID, I'd ask for a show of hands. Has anybody been in North Korea? And occasionally there's someone who's been to the demilitarized zone. But North Korea is a place basically people don't, don't go. It's difficult to get there, it's expensive. And there, there are some inherent dangers. But they of course have now launched an effort to develop nuclear weapons and have succeeded. To dither blindly and ignore them seems a, an unwise policy. On the other hand, they've been a hostile nation and have been separate from South Korea now since the Korean War ended in 1953. That's a long time for dogma to keep this regime going. As you can see on the map, North Korea is separated from China, separates China from South Korea, where, where in the US military has bases. The Chinese want North Korea to continue because they don't want to have South Korea on their own border with China. So it's a political riddle that has not been solved. But in 2009, I was president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and led a contingent of American scientists, in North Korea where we met with the scientists themselves. We didn't meet with any politicians. This was not a political visit, this was a scientific visit. And shown here I am with members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, funded by the Lonsbury Foundation, Syracuse University professor, and there's a non-for-profit agency called the CRDF Global, they were present. And we had a wonderful visit, but it was a strange visit. Pyongyang, a lovely city, seems to have almost minimal electrical grid. It's almost like it was a ghost city. It reminded me of the old TV show, The Twilight Zone. I think there's been some remakes of The Twilight Zone. It looks real, but it's not real. And of course, the regime has been run by the Kim family on the far right, Kim Il-sung, who was the liberator of North Korea from the Japanese who held Korea during World War II. His son, Kim Jong-il, succeeded him, and now he's dead, and the third generation, Kim Jong-un, is in charge. And it's almost as if these communist leaders were demigods. It's clearly, the people of North Korea view them as heroes. And there's a culture, the Juchi culture of self-reliance. It's a myth. The North Koreans have not succeeded in developing their agriculture satisfactory. They're dependent on donations of foodstuffs from South Korea, from China, from abroad. But the, the illusion that they're self-reliant and any aid goes to the army first, makes this a very difficult place to foster humanitarian efforts. The regime in Pyongyang celebrates the, the big, big victory over the Americans during the Korean War. In fact, it was in a ceasefire in 1953 with no treaty. There's still no peace, peace treaty. South Korea and North Korea are technically still at war. But the people believe what they see, and so this monument celebrates their victory. You would think so, walking around Pyongyang, that they, they were the victors. They built this underground 
metro system, which has beautiful murals. But again, perpetuating this myth that North Korea is the land of paradise, a worker's paradise. Were it true? So the children of North Korea are exactly like the children in South Korea. Many of them don't have rich lives because of the agricultural insufficiencies. But these are children probably of a wealthy families in their young pioneers group in Pyongyang. And they're laughing, they're seeing foreigners because they see very few foreigners. Of course, the little girls on the left are all laughing. The little boys on the right are, as little boys often are kind of aloof, not knowing what's going on. But these kids are not diehard communists. They repeat what they're taught, but they don't hate America. They just don't know the difference. And I think by being present in North Korea at all and doing giving lectures and meeting with their university people, it might be a small step towards reducing the tensions. This is a, outside of Kim Chek University, a leading technical university in Pyongyang. And at the Great People's Reading Hall, they have scientific journals on display. They can't get too many because of the embargo. Again, the embargo to prevent them from developing weapons, but we're better at reducing their culture, but they want to read science magazines. So the emphasis is on agricultural development to increase the foodstuffs to feed the nation. There's a beautiful valley growing apple trees. Very tasty apple, I have to tell you. So this gentleman and I don't know each other, but he was one of the discussion leaders for our visit to the apple orchard. And here I am outside of a brand new university in Pyongyang. This is now 10 years back. This brand new university, Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, has an unusual feature. The language of instruction is English. So there's an inherent risk here. We're educating young North Koreans to speak English and study science. The hope is, of course, by becoming friends with their instructors. Because many of the instructors, until recently, until Donald Trump initiated a no, no travel policy, many of the instructors were Americans would go over and teach for a semester or two. It's still there and they still have outstanding classes, but until they can reconfigure our relationship, we're not allowed to visit or teach. And it's a little different. The gift of this wonderful man James Kim, a Florida businessman, made several million dollars. He was Korean born. It was his vision and his gift that led to the creation of the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. He wants our people to come closer together. And here I am at a reception. I am shaking hands with the, the Minister of Education for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. He seemed like a perfectly nice gentleman and we certainly didn't talk about anything political. We just talked about science and education. So here are the students going to class. See them, that doesn't look like Johns Hopkins. I can't imagine you and your classmates marching to class, singing patriotic songs, but there you have it. There's some things we can do and some things we can't do. And the maintenance of a military-like discipline is, it, is sort of the propaganda of, of the old regime. But in spite of this, somewhat formal, frosty behavior. When I lectured them, the students never laughed when I told them what I thought was a joke until I explained it's a joke, it's funny, you can laugh. Then they would laugh. They went laughing because they needed permission to laugh. The enforcement is so strong. But they're pleasant young people. It was initially all male. S. Johns Hopkins was all male. Now they have women students. It's a small group, maybe 5% of the students are women. But if you ask people who've been at Johns Hopkins after it went co-ed, it got better. It's natural. And here I am, this is the vice president of the State Academy of Sciences at our farewell banquet. I gave him the tie, necktie I was wearing when I won the Nobel Prize some years earlier. So I, I'd like to close with just some words of wisdom. I imagine some of the audience has come from Chinese, immigrant families and may have the use of the language. The wisdom of, of China is remarkable. The 
the character for crisis is really two two characters, and in Korean it's also two characters: Weiji in Mandarin or Huiji in Korean. And the two characters represent we, a time of danger, G, a time of opportunity. Isn't that so true? Isn't that really what science is all about? And you all, as young adults, have just lived through what is not yet over, a pandemic of COVID. It, it, it was pretty frightening. And some of you may have had family members who were severely infected or even passed on. I know we have, but the creation of vaccines, the distribution of public health, as, as well as the simple public health measures of social distancing and wearing masks have turned the tide and there'll be new crises that'll come up. We certainly have the crisis of ongoing malaria, still a major killer, drug resistant tuberculosis, global warming. These are all problems which science can help. And so as you grow in your careers, I hope you'll keep this in mind. And I hope you'll all have as much fun in your career as I have. I can't imagine a more fun or rewarding career than to be a scientist. So Sam, that's, that's my story. If some of your students have questions, I'll do my best to answer. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to reach out. And I hope you'll all keep Johns Hopkins in mind when you're making your decisions as to which university is the best for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Agri, and for sharing your amazing story. Um, we'll now go ahead and shift to our question and answer session. Students, uh, if you are called on, uh, if you submitted a question, do turn your camera on if possible. Please let us know what grade you're in and where you're from before asking your question. And we're not um, going to ask what your SAT scores are. That's irrelevant. <laughs> What's in your heart? <laughs> Uh, let's see. First, I think we have a question from Katrina Yang, if you're still here. Hi, hey, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm from the UK and I actually have two questions. So firstly, throughout your years working with malaria, have you seen an increase um, in the number of like patients with sickle cell anemia? And secondly, I have quite a personal question, but since I'm quite interested in neurodegenerative diseases, um, has the, your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease affected your clinical work? Well, second first, the Parkinson's has been a problem. I'm, I'm still up in Adam. I went for a vigorous four, four mile walk along the Mississippi River Valley. I'm visiting Minnesota where I grew up. And so I'm able to do some things, but not others. My, my voice is sometimes hard to predict. And I know it sounds a little bit croaky, but sometimes it's much worse. I've reduced the travel, I, part because of COVID, it's not possible to go travel. But I plan to return to Africa and I'll have to be more limited in my activities. But I'm also 72 years old. There's a process called old age, which <laughs> is inevitable. So I think it's a matter of shifting objectives and being realistic. I will pass the baton as director of the Malaria Institute. It's time to have a, number, a younger director and we have some outstanding candidates. There's still a lot to do in malaria. Now, the first question about sickle cell is a very important one. And it tells us something about malaria. In Southern Zambia and Zimbabwe, sickle cell hemoglobin, sickle cell anemia is relatively rare. It tells us that probably malaria was not prevalent in that part of Africa for generations as it was in West Africa or Central Africa, because it's well known that sickle trait, the carriers have a protection against malaria. That doesn't mean that they're home free. If they get malaria, they have less severe forms. It's sort of like being vaccinated in a sense. Flu shot doesn't mean you can't get flu, but it probably means some people won't get flu and some people will have flu less severe. In Southern Africa, Zimbabwe and Zambia, as I said, sickle hemoglobin is less rare, but malaria was present. But malaria is now coming under control there. In Northern Zambia, on the border of Congo, where sickle cell anemia is found more commonly, malaria is still out of control. So the, the, the linkage is established and the carriers of the sickle hemoglobin trait 
should be regarded as normal people. But of course, they should understand if they are carriers, if, if they have children, they can be diagnosed and, and treated. Katrina, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking it. Thank you. I think next we can go to a question by uh, Hyunjung. Um, hello, I'm in, I, I live in South Korea and um, I'm in 11th grade. Um, my question is, um, I noticed you included a lot of elements from geography and history in your presentation. So I was wondering what you thought of as um, you know, areas of study that are most important for students pursuing public health. Well, that's a good question. I think a firm background in science is really essential to do any significant scholarly work. That doesn't mean that aid workers all have to be physical chemistry majors, but I think the, the chemistry, biology, and of course, all of the engineering things are moving rapidly. What's possible for electronics? They have a general background in the, the use of state-of-the-art electronics is helpful. And I, I don't have that with the Parkinson's. I have lost my dexterity and I have trouble with the, the smartphones. And I think maintaining an interest in what's happening in the world. The news media is our best source. I, I challenge people to watch, listen, but be careful because we have polarized news agencies now. It's no longer always objective. We have right-wing talk shows and television shows that are, from my view, completely unrealistic. And the, and the left side has their own propaganda, but there is a middle ground, which we should probably seek and to be aware of what's going on, but we're, we're there as health leaders not to proselytize for religious groups or for political groups, but to do what we know best, and that's to enhance the well being of the health of the people. So I, I would suggest you know, uh, having a, an undergraduate program where you have humanities, and at Johns Hopkins, our, our undergraduate students may concentrate on engineering or the physical sciences or natural sciences. But they all take courses in social science and literature and Landon King and Charlie Weiner and I teach a course every January, stories of science and medicine. So I think being well balanced could, could be helpful. But there's so much you can do here. I think at your stage in university, there's so many directions you could go. It's not a matter of what could I do, but which one of the wonderful opportunities should I follow? I wish you the best. Thank you so much. And I surely hope that long before you're my age, there'll be one Korea. Thank you. Next we can go to Naharan. Um, hello, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm Naharan, a um, rising sophomore in Atlanta, Georgia. And throughout your presentation, I've noticed the common theme in each of the countries where science brings people together, you do not discuss politics with the people you meet. Why is this? And what role, do, sorry, do politics play in promoting and or hurting global health? Well, I think we're guests in these countries. And I would not think it would be taken well if, I'll turn this back here, if agents of another country came to the United States to steer political viewpoints or pass on their propaganda. If they came as scientists or engineers, that'd be totally different. So I think some discipline is necessary. And my own political views really don't have anything to do with the treatment of infectious diseases. We need to make a rapid diagnosis, establish the best possible therapy, and, and prevent the diseases from occurring to, to others. So I, I think to be mindful and respectful, and I, I share the inside track in terms of in Zimbabwe in particular, being able to work there. The Mugabe regime now is passed on. Robert Mugabe was deposed and subsequently passed away. And there's a new government, but our challenge in terms of malaria remains the same. 
So we're there as scientists and humanitarians, as physicians, not as politi political propagandists. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Well, thank you for asking. Best wishes to you. Next, we can go to a question from Siram. Hello, doctor. My name is Siram. I am a rising sophomore from Seoul, Ohio. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was really inspiring and really insightful. Um, one question I have is you talked a lot about, um, especially in Africa, about children who are like greatly affected by malaria. Also, the disparity between, say, Zambia and Zimbabwe. So like, this engenders a feeling of moral obligation and moral duty and also strong emotion. So does this like just motivate scientific work and research, especially by being on the field or in the field and experiencing all this firsthand? Or does it also sometimes become uncontrollable and just like hamper the correct progression of research with strong emotion? That's a good question. I think the answer is it's hard to really work with all your abilities year after year as something that you don't carry in your heart. So I think feeling a, an emotional commitment is natural. And if you don't have that, you probably won't remain motivated. On the other hand, we're not there to save souls. There are religious people that can do that. But no one will benefit unless we can improve the health of the needy. So I, I, I don't do this as any religious calling. And myself, I'm not a church goer. I grew up in the Lutheran church in the US, but um, that's not something I pursue. But I certainly respect those the medical missionaries who may have been sent to these countries by churches to do health work. So I, I, I don't feel that it's caused me to be unobjective. I think the analysis of science is always the object pursuit of reality and to use that information as well as we can. And it is rewarding when I show the pictures of some of these people, like Ali Akbar Saleh or Philip Tuma, Sangana Mark, who are, these are real people like, like you and me with feelings and family and all of them could be making more money doing something else. It's not that. I think, you know, when, when you're pursuing something that is in your heart. And I think it's, it's easy to feel good when you can do something for the well-being of others. That's what keeps a lot of people going. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Next, I think we have a question from Neil, if you're still here. Yes, thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. I'm Neil. I'm, I just finished my sophomore year. Uh, I'm in Saline, Michigan. And I have two quick questions. The first is about your research in aquaporin. And um, I'm very interested in molecular biology and that aspect of things. So I, I found your research very interesting. And I was wondering, I know there was the previous model of water diffusing across the phospholipid bilayer, which um, you realized was not the complete model, which led you to your discovery of aquaporin. So I was wondering what made you think that that model was wrong and led you to predict the existence of aquaporin so you knew what to look for? And second, I was wondering what got you interested in malaria? I know you did a lot of work with malaria and what kind of spiked that interest in the beginning? Sure, thanks, Neil. So I didn't talk about the aquaporins today because I, I thought we can do that another time. Come to Johns Hopkins, I'll have a seminar all about that. I, I think it would be misleading to say that we discovered the aquaporins. I'd, I'd rather say that they discovered us. It wasn't a pursuit of the water channel that biophysicists had argued for a long time. Physiologists had argued for a long time. How is it that water crosses membranes relatively slowly unless specific situations occur, like Pavlov's dog. The dog hears the bell ringing, salivates, profuse salivation. I mean, it's remarkable. It didn't just happen by accident. Yet the nature of the water transporter, generation of saliva, and the same could be said of cerebrospinal fluid, aqueous humor in our eyes, tears, sweat, pulmonary 
secretions or renal concentration, there must be a, a mechanism to in, enhance the permeability. And physiologists, as I said, argued about the nature and the simple diffusion of water across a lipid bilayer, which will occur with any lipid bilayer, is, is finite, but it's not zero. And the physiologists who were determined to identify the water channel all were hamstrung because of their limitations. It's, the background permeability doesn't go from zero to an enormous value. It may go up two logs. And so when I say the aquaporins discover us, I, I, I'm, what I'm really trying to facetiously mention is that we were pursuing the RH blood group antigen. I'm a hematologist. And the nature of RH, RH negative women who become pregnant, RH positive children, was due to an antigen that no one had not known. And we were able to isolate it. And in the process, a contaminant in our preparations was very curious. And that contaminant we figured out was aquaporin 1. And the truth is, the suggestion that this new protein we identified might be a water channel was made by a dear friend of mine, a former professor, John Parker at the University of North Carolina. When I talked to him, this is on one of our family vacations, took the kids to Disney World, driving back to Baltimore from Chapel Hill, talked to John, explained that there's a protein in red cells that no one had reported before because it doesn't stain with cumacin. You can't see it's there. We knew it was there because we had an antibody that reacted with it and we purified it to homogeneity, and that protein is aquaporin 1. It was John who suggested you should think that this might test to see if this might be the water channel, which people have been searching for with no success. So I, I'd say aquaporins discovered us. And of course, once we made that first report, there was tremendous interest in the renal community, the transport community. We're joined by dozens, literally dozens, hundreds of other scientists working on aquaporins. The genetic database now has thousands of aquaporins from different species basically any living organism, plant, microbe, even the archaea have members of the aquaporin family. So we were pretty lucky. I guess that's what science is about. Be as lucky as you can, but sometimes things are easy and sometimes things are hard. We were very fortunate. But we had the opportunity, and that opportunity was made possible by the United States support of science. We had great laboratories to train in, resources to pursue the likelihood that this is a water channel protein and collaborate with numerous scientists. So one guy gets the Nobel Prize, but really it's a whole community of scientists, and even the competing laboratories contribute. That's why science moves ahead. I hope I answered your questions. Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, we can go to Amanna. You have your hand raised. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question was, um, I noticed that you went to a lot of different countries, a lot of different languages, and I was wondering how the language barriers have impacted your research and your work in different countries. Well, that's a, that's a good question because the practical reality is communication is essential. <clears throat> so we work in these other countries in partnership with, with endemic country organizations. In northern Zambia, we work in collaboration with the Tropical Disease Research Center in Indola. Initially, a WHO initiative led the program sponsored by the government of Zambia. So we're working with Zambian people and our field teams speak the local languages. Our friends, some of them are American, but they're fluent in the languages we need. We considered multiple places in Africa to establish our field centers and chose Zambia and Zimbabwe in part because English is the language of education and commerce. So even in the rural districts, when I was younger and healthier, I would go jogging in the morning and the little boys and girls in their school uniforms from very poor families with scrub and walking with their backpacks would see me. They thought this was hilarious to see an old white man jogging. So they asked me, where are you going? I'd say, well, I'm, I'm just jogging. Where are you from? I say, I'm from the United States. We could converse. Of course, then I tell them, Barack Obama is our, my 
president, they would always go, yes, he is our hero. And being able to converse, I think, has made that easier. Of course, in North Korea, we're restricted. We can't travel throughout the country. At the Pyongyang University, the students all speak English. Their professors all speak English. The Korean government officials do not speak English. So we have to rely on translation. Iran, English is pretty widespread amongst the university group. So it's good to have a background in foreign languages. If I were young, I wish I would have studied Spanish. In fact, I studied German. When I go to Germany and speak in German, the answer is always in perfect English. So the language can be a barrier, but it need not be impossible. I hope I answered your question. Well, thank you so much for the question, students. Uh, with that, we'll be concluding Dr. Agri's presentation and Q&A session at the 2021 Global Health Leaders Conference. Uh, on behalf of our conference board and the students in our program, uh, thank you so much for speaking at our conference, uh, Dr. Agri. There are many, many thank you messages for you in the chat, uh, in the Zoom meeting chat. Uh, you're an incredible person and an amazing role model uh, for all of us, and we, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. This has been a delightful hour for me. And who knows, I'd like to see some of you on our campus. Probably will see some of you on our campus in about another year or two. There are many great places to have a career, but I think Hopkins has been special for me. Thank you so much. 